I'll be honest with you, it would be easy right now. Just say we've had church and go home. But I cannot tell you how much I believe in what the scripture I believe is speaking to us today. And sometimes we need to make sure that we give honor to the word. And I want to give honor to the word. In your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We have been going through the I am's in the book of John. There's seven I am's. We know that the first I am that we discovered was when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Then he said, I am the light of the world that shines through darkness. He said, I am the door. You can't get to heaven unless you go through the door. The door is Jesus Christ. And then he said, I am the good shepherd. Well, today we're going to look at this next I am statement. It's found in the gospel of John chapter 11. If you got it, say amen. If you don't, say oh me, okay? John chapter 11, beginning in verse 21. The Bible says, Then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said, she went her way, and she called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come, and he calleth for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly, and she came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into town, but was in that place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews which were with her in the house comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out and followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. And Mary, then when Mary was come to where Jesus was, she saw him and she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. This is the sermon about overcoming disappointment. I don't know if there would ever been a more disappointing time in the, in the Gospels than what we are seeing right here in the Gospel of John. You see, the Bible tells us, and we're going to get into it late, that Jesus was very connected to Lazarus. He was very connected to Martha. He was very connected to Mary. And when Lazarus got sick, all of a sudden, they began to search out for Jesus. But before they could get to Jesus or Jesus could get back to them, Lazarus had died. And you see a statement in both Mary and Martha. And the statement is both in unison. Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would still be alive. They were speaking in disappointment. And to be honest with you, they were not disappointed that he died they were disappointed in Jesus they were disappointed that at Jesus they Martha said it Jesus if you would have been here I know you have the power my brother would have never died why'd you let him die and I want to tell you something today in overcoming disappointment would you bow your heads with me Heavenly Father I just pray to help me preach this word today the way that you want it preached. Help people to receive it the way that you want them to receive it. And God, that we would leave here today knowing that we can overcome disappointment. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. This particular passage is very interesting to me because I do see all the elements of disappointment. What I want to share with you today is why is disappointment so hard? You see, disappointment is a very difficult thing for people to live in. And so when you read this particular passage, we see that disappointment is in Mary and Martha. They are very disappointed in Jesus, their brother, that they know Jesus knew, that they know Jesus had, had a relationship with, and yet 
He is dead. He is, in, he is about to be in the tomb. There's no hope for anything to change in his life. And the Jesus that they knew has let them down. And so in verse 3, I want to just give you some things about why disappointment is so hard. You see, when disappointment comes in our life, we begin ourselves to look at Jesus sometimes with the same eyes that Mary and Martha looked at Jesus. And those were through the lens of disappointment. And so what we find, there's some things beginning in verse 3 that teaches us about why disappointment is so hard. It says in verse 3, Therefore his sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Boy, they went deep because they played the love card right off the bat. They played the love card. You love Lazarus, Jesus. He's sick. We need you to change his situation. And, and, and you know, in all of us, we, we do that sometimes about Jesus. You know, Jesus, you love me. Why am I going through this? Jesus, I know that you love me, but why are you allowing this to happen? And the reason that disappointment is so hard is because of one word. And that word is expectation. You see, there is never any disappointment in your life if you have no expectation of something different. The only reason people suffer disappointment in their life is when they have one expectation and that expectation is not met in their life. And right here, we find there is an expectation by Mary and Martha that Jesus, you love Lazarus, so we know that you're not going to let him die. And I'll tell you today, there's a truth in this that we all need to learn, that if we could learn this truth, it would help you throughout the rest of your life. And this is the truth. Sickness and problems are by no means compatible to how much Jesus loves you and meaning that when sickness and problems come in our life, it does not mean that Jesus does not love us. Their mind was that Jesus loved Lazarus, so therefore he was going to heal him and he would never die. I want you to understand something today. Jesus loves every man and woman in this church. Jesus loves us no matter what the problems are. And you're going to have disappointment in your life the moment that you begin to say, well, God, if you love me, this, was, this would not happen in my life. You're going to suffer through disappointing days. Because I want you to understand, God did not bring sin and sickness and circumstances into this world. God came to change sin and circumstances that are in this world. Sin brought those things into our life. And God, through Jesus Christ, has come to help us heal from our disappointments. And he never brings problems into our life so that we suffer through disappointment he is here to bring us out of disappointment and here's Mary and Martha they sent word to Jesus Lazarus who you love is is sick and we need you to do something you see in this situation when you find God about to do something there has to be some dire times that we are in and the second truth that I want you to find is in verse four. It says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Notice what he said. He said, when he got there, when he came into the situation, he said, this sickness is not about Lazarus. It's about the glory of God. You remember when the disciples were out on the sea and the storm was coming? I, I want you to hear what their words were in Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. He says, and when they were in the, he was in the hinder part of the ship, he was asleep on a pillow and they awoke in him. And, he, and they said unto him, Master, don't you care that we are perishing? You see, there's moments in our life where we want to have that mentality, God, you don't know what I'm going through. And in that moment, Jesus was sleeping on his pillow. And they're calling out to God, God, don't you even care how bad I'm hurting. And I want you to say today, there's a lot of people who live in disappointment. 
And that's their prayer to God. God, don't you even see how bad this pain is in my life. God, don't you even know that this this suffering that I'm going through is killing me. And when Jesus looked at these words, he didn't say that he was going. What he said was, this sickness. He says, put that verse back up, verse 5 for me. When he put that verse back, if you would put verse 5 up, it says, and when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is unto not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. In other words, this. This isn't going to be about Lazarus. This is about the Son being glorified. And there's a powerful truth that we all have to understand in this world. God comes in to change our life, but his ultimate plan is for the glory of the kingdom of God. And sometimes he's got to work details that are not in our favor, but it's going to bring glory to the kingdom of God. And if we understand that, disappointment never gets a hold of us because we go into situations that look bad. We go into situations that look hard. And instead of looking at the situation and blaming God and being in disappointment, we begin to see, God, you're going to bring glory to the kingdom of God. And I know that your son is going to be lifted up. And when we get our eyes on that, it takes the disappointment out of our life. Now I want to read something to you. You see... In John chapter 6 and verse 38, it says, Jesus said these words, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but do the will of the one that sent me. This is what God's saying to us. It is not about our will and disappointment. It's about the will of God that we have to succumb to and let God work in our life. You see, Jesus loved both of them. If you look in verse verse 5, he says, Now Jesus loved Martha. He loved Mary. He loved Lazarus. In other words, there's no doubt that Jesus loved them. But he still stayed where he was at two more days. I want you to hear something to me today, church. To know God sometimes is to know him in some of our dire moments of our life, which means you can't know the God who is your refuge if you never go through trouble. You will never know the God who can cover you in the storm if you never go through a storm. That's why when I read these verses, it tells me that God is trying to remind us that he loves us. But sometimes, even in that love, he allows things to happen in our life. And then in verse 7, when we see these words, it says, Then after that, he said unto his disciples, Let us go into Judea. Why did he say, let us go into Judea? He's about to teach us how to overcome disappointment. Just a few verses over in chapter 10, when Jesus was last time in Judea, he looked at that situation and they wanted to stone him. They drove him out of Judea. They they made him lose Judea. And so now Jesus is telling his disciples, let us go back to Judea. You know why? This is a powerful understanding of how you can overcome disappointment in your life. Number one, you always have to be submissive to the plan of God, even if it does not fit your plan. Let me say it again. You can only overcome disappointment when you will be submissive to the plan of God more than you are your plan of how God needs to handle it. Because right here it teaches us. Jesus said, we're going back to Judea. And later on his disciples said, why in the world are we going back to Judea? Don't you remember that the last time we were there, they wanted to kill you? I want you to hear something to me, church, today. There are places in your life that have brought a lot of pain and disappointment. But sometimes before God can heal you, he sends you back to deal with you in the Judea situations of your life. And in this moment right here, God is sending, Jesus is sending them back to Judea knowing that the last time he was there, they wanted to stone him. You see Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What does it tell us? Does it talk about our will? It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I got bad news for us, church. It is not always about our plans. 
Sometimes God is going to take you back to Judea. And it's in Judea he's going to work some of the greatest miracles you've ever seen in your life. But if we allow our lives to stay in disappointment, we will never go back to the Judea places of our past. Because Judea represented pain. Judea represented trouble. But God said, I'm sending them back to that pain and trouble because it's in that pain and trouble I'm about to work a miracle that they have never seen in their life. Let me tell you today, God, God is trying to remind somebody here, you're in disappointment and there's a place in your past that God may have to send you back spiritually to remind you. It's not going to be a pain of dis- a place of disappointment anymore. It's going to be a place of victory for you. It's going to be a place where God turns your greatest disappointment into your greatest victory. Why? Because God has the power to remove disappointment out of our life. And so he said, hey, you got to go back to Judea. And when he sent them back to Judea, Luke 22 and 42, Jesus knew that even himself, he had to be submissive to the will of the Father. And, and Luke 22 and 42, it says, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says, if thou be willing, Father, will you remove this cup from me? But Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. Church, when you are in disappointment, if you can learn to operate into the submissiveness of the sovereignty of God, change can happen in your life. Because I want you to understand, God is a sovereign God. And God never works plans to try to destroy you. He only works plans to try to change whatever future you have. And sometimes to bring about the change that you need in your future, the one thing he needs you to do is say, God, I submit to your will. But I say this today, we're not good at submission. This world does not like submission. Everybody's got a better plan than God. Everybody's got a better way than God. And that's why so many people are living in disappointment. It's because of that one word, submission. But the day in your life that you begin to say, God, I don't like this. I think it's all right to tell God we don't like it sometimes. But we tell God, I don't like this. I don't like what I'm having to go through. I don't like these feelings that I'm having. But God, I believe that you're the God of heaven and earth. I believe that you're the God of yesterday and tomorrow. And God, if you know what's best for me, I believe that you're going to work to good all those things because I love you and I submit my will to you. God, would you help me with my disappointment? That's when God begins to move you from your disappointment. But as long as you're trying to tell God how he needs to do it, you're going to have a lot of disappointment in your life. Because when you read these verses, God is pretty much saying, I'm not going to do it the way everybody thought I should do it. He waited two more days. I promise you, if you were in the same circumstance with Mary and Martha, and somebody in your family had died, and and you know that they loved you, and you sent word, and you know that Jesus got your word, and when he got it, he hung around two more days, you would be a mad church member. You'd be mad at everybody. Because in your mind, you'd be going, God... You said you love me, and I'm in disappointment. You told me you were with me, and you still waited two days. What are you doing? And we have to have a submissive nature, and that's why he told them in verse 7, he said, let us go into Judea. And then, if you notice down in verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. There's a powerful truth to overcoming disappointment in these verses. Jesus looks at his disciples and notice what he said. He said, you know what? There's 12 hours in the day. When you walk in the day, you can see things clearly. But if you walk in the night, things that you used to be able to see clearly or things that are clear are no longer clear because you're walking in darkness. This is the truth that Jesus was telling us about overcoming disappointment. When we walk in the light, we're never going to stumble. 
We will only stumble in our lives when we begin to walk in darkness. And this is how Jesus framed it to the disciples. When you are with me, you won't ever have to worry about stumbling. The only time you're going to stumble in your disappointment is when you go back to the darkness. When you go back to the old way that you used to think. When you go back to the old path that you used to be on. But as long as you walk with me, disciples, you never have to worry about stumbling. Meaning this, even in disappointment, we have to walk with Jesus. Even when it looks like our heart is broken, we still have to walk with Jesus. Because even you may be walking with Jesus in disappointment, but you don't have to worry about falling. You may be walking in Jesus and your heart is broken, but you'll never have to worry about falling. As long as you are with Jesus, everything is always going to be all right. And so he told the disciples, I need you to walk with me in light. And after he told them that he would walk with them in light, the last thing that we see in these verses, he says, but if a man walk in the night, he's going to stumble because there's no light in him. He goes on down in verse 15 to tell us the last truth about disappointment. He said, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. For to the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go to him. Let me tell you this. Jesus said, I am glad that I'm not there. If, if he were to told the family that, can you imagine how many? You ever sent the wrong text to the wrong person? You thought you were texting somebody and you sent it to somebody else. Can you imagine if Mary and Martha was on the other end of this text line and he had meant to send a text to the disciples to tell them, I'm glad, but we still going. But I'm glad that he's dead. In other words, I'm glad that this is the way it is. Can you imagine, instead of sending that to Peter, John, and Thomas, he sent it to Mary and Martha and said, I am glad. Can you imagine the anger that they would have had? But if you notice in those verses in verse 15, that's exactly what he said. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. You see... When you look at these verses, they would now see higher manifestations of his power than they had ever seen had he been there. I want to tell you something today, church. When you are willing to walk through some disappointing days, there's some higher manifestations of his power that you can only see if you're willing to walk through some disappointing days. Now, your question is, well, I would rather not walk through disappointment. Then there's things in the spiritual realm that you'll never understand. You know, I think we put that scripture, Psalm 46 and 1. Psalm 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in a time of trouble. Well, let me tell you this. I don't know if you, you, you probably don't like that verse. Because Jesus says, I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. The only way you can know him as refuge and strength is in a time of trouble. And so you'll never know him as refuge and strength if you're not willing to go through the trouble. And so when Jesus said, I am glad, he was saying to the disciples, I'm glad because now you're going to get a witness to a strength and a power had you never seen if we would never walk through this disappointment in their life. And I want you to see something today, church. There's a lot of people who allow disappointment to bring them back instead of looking for the opportunity for God to bring a miracle in their life. Hear me today. The only way this miracle was going to take place that we're going to get to was because disappointment had to come before the miracle. I want you to hear me today. Sometimes you go, you walking through disappointment right now, but it's setting you up for a miracle. And if all you can see is the disappointment, then you're missing the I am glad moment in the, in the, in the whole scenario. And so today, I, think about this, church. How many times have you said in a moment of disappointment, boy, I am glad? 
On the other hand, have you cried to everybody in the world trying to tell them how bad your circumstances is? Because I'm telling you, if you get a breakthrough today, when that disappointment comes and you say, God, it is not my will, but thou be done. In other words, you give submission to his will, and then all of a sudden you say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm glad because I believe, God, you're going to do a miracle in my situation. God, I don't like it, but I'm still glad because I believe that, God, you worked all things to my good. I want some Somebody here today to say next time you go through a disappointment in your life you say God I am glad because you're setting up a miracle in my future and I just got to be submissive to what you're doing in the right now moment of my life and right here he says tell him I am glad I am glad you see when you look at this there's some things we understand no one in scripture ever died in the presence of Jesus. Look throughout the New Testament. No one ever died in the presence of Jesus. In other words, if Jesus would have been with Lazarus, he wouldn't have died. You might say, well, that would be a good thing. Not really. Because Jesus was about to tell them, I am the resurrection and the life. And he was going to give them resurrection power. You see... You need and I need resurrection power. And if Jesus would have never shown us resurrection power, we would not have any future in our life. It was because Jesus was willing to go to the cross and to die that resurrection power. A lot of people don't understand that. You know what? For us to have resurrection power mean that Jesus had to go through resurrection power. And this miracle he's about to perform was to show us what resurrection power was going to look like. What that mean was we were dead in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses but because Jesus came along we were stinking in the grave it was four days and it looked like there was no hope but I praise my Lord and Savior right now that I don't live in disappointment right now in 2022 I live in resurrection power because I found out that Jesus did to go to the grave I found out that on the third day he arose out of the grave and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved I don't know about you church I'm glad for some resurrection power that has changed our life and it's only through that resurrection power we can have any victory in our life Amen. there's no greater disappointment that is that is stronger than the resurrection power of Jesus and you will never die spiritually as long as you are in the presence of Jesus another thing we find from this particular passage is the second one is if Jesus would have done it the way Barry and Martha wanted him to do it, the disciples would have never seen someone raised from the dead. We wouldn't have anything. So sometimes in your life, if God would have done it the way you wanted him to do it, you would have missed a manifestation that you've never seen in your life. Aren't you glad sometimes God don't do it the way you do it, want it done? Because you're not sovereign. It might fix your pain for the moment. But it don't, it don't fix his victory for the rest of your life. Yeah. Number three, there are times when you do not feel you can get to Jesus. Mary and Martha, they were like, we can't get to him. But I want you to hear something. When you can't get to Jesus, but there's never a doubt that should be in your life that Jesus cannot get to you. You see, in this moment, Mary and Martha thought they couldn't get to Jesus. But Jesus was coming to them. Why was he coming? Verse 17 tells us why. Because it says, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. The response to disappointment was almost there. But Lazarus was in the grave for four days. I could give you all these spiritual connotations of that. In the Hebrew culture, they believed that the spirit stayed inside of a person for a certain amount of days, but after four days, they were really dead. I don't know how long it takes for somebody to be really dead. I'll just be honest with you, but they, the scripture wants us to know that Lazarus was really dead. That's why it says four days. That's the, the, the country version of it. He was really dead. He was really dead because later on it says he was already starting to decompose. He was already starting to stink. And what we learn from this John always uses natural stories to teach about spiritual things, principles that he wanted us to learn. 
That's why in John chapter 2, you remember Jesus went to the wedding and they didn't have wine at the wedding? The natural situation was that there was a wedding with no wine. The spiritual situation was that there was a nation with no joy, right? And later on, you remember when the nobleman's son had disease in his life and he was sick and Jesus was coming to heal him. The natural situation says that the son had disease. The spiritual situation was that all of mankind was spiritually diseased and had no hope in their future. You remember when the man with the withered hand and the Bible says that he couldn't stretch it out. The natural said that there was a man who had a hand and he didn't have the strength to let it out. The spiritual situation, situation was that there was a nation who had lost its strength. You see, in that story, it tells us that there was a time in that man's life that he was able to stretch out his hand. But because of the circumstances and the sin and all these things that had affected the world, that the man's hand that used to be able to stretch out has now shrunk in. And what John was saying, that was the nation of Israel. There was a time where their hand stretched out to praise God, but now after 400 years, Years of no profit that hand that used to stretch out to God had now withered back and there was no praise in the nation you remember the story about the blind man the natural said that there was a man who had been blind from birth but the spiritual said that we are that nation we were all blind we were all walking in darkness and now what did Jesus did he came to heal them and bring them out of their blindness that's the same thing in verse 17 Lazarus in the natural is dead, but in the spiritual, he represents all of mankind, that we were all dead in our sins. Everybody here before Jesus, we're all de dead in our trespasses. Why? Because we're born into sin. But what Jesus was about to do, he was about to show us his response. When disappointment comes, Jesus is always coming to bring us a word to change us out of our disappointment. And I just want to give you these in closing. I want to give you Jesus' response when we are going through trouble. You see, if I look at these today, I begin to think to myself, what does Jesus, when I have disappointment in my heart, what does Jesus do for my disappointment? Well, verse 25 is your first one. Notice what he said. This is Jesus' response. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is what Mary and Martha were doing, and this is what we do when we're in disappointment. Mary and Martha could only focus on that Lazarus was dead. All they could focus on was that Lazarus, you love him, and now he's dead. But notice the response that Jesus had to her when he got there. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. This is the truth of overcoming your disappointment in your life. Listen to me. When you face disappointment, do not focus on your disappointment. Focus on the person of Jesus. Because Jesus, when he, his answer was, I know Martha. I know I loved him. I know that he loved me. I know that he was sick. I know that you were disappointed. Jesus looked into Martha's eyes and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know what he was telling her? You can't have a life. There's a divine order that is in this verse. Notice what it says. I am the resurrection and the life. You can't have a life, Martha, until you understand the resurrection power that I'm about to show you. I want you to hear me today. There is no life in this world until you experience resurrection power in your soul. And you might be going today, well, I, I'm not dead. I hadn't experienced resurrection power. Oh, if you are a believer... Through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been given resurrection power. Which means the last breath that you take on this earth, you get to be reunited with Jesus in heaven. And, 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 there, and people want to have all this life while they're here on earth. I got some bad news for people. There is no life without resurrection power. Because I don't care how good you got it while you live here, it's never going to be better than you have it with Jesus when you get to heaven. I don't care how good and how, how great it is here on earth. And I want things to be good and great. 
great, but they're never greater than the resurrection that Jesus has given us on his life. So the only life you can have, listen to me, man and woman, boy and girl that is here today, don't try to have a life without living in resurrection power. Meaning, don't you try to satisfy the flesh without knowing that your spirit is going to be with Jesus forever. Because there will be never enough in the flesh that will feed the desires of your heart. But I have always been satisfied when I gave my life to Jesus Christ because I know that he has changed my life forever. That's what he told him. He said, I am the way. I am the way. And, and let me say this today, church. If the person of Jesus is the only one that can help you with your disappointment. And so get your eyes off the disappointment and get them on Jesus. The next thing we find, if you look down in verse 32, this is when Mary comes. When Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in his spirit, and he was troubled. The response of Jesus to your disappointment. Number one, we find that when Jesus saw her weeping, the Bible says Jesus began to groan. Why did Jesus groan? Because he was like a soldier that was about to go to war. He was about to go to war with death. And he groaned because he saw the effect that death had on mankind. And when he saw the effect that death had on mankind, I want you to understand something. Jesus always feels your pain before he moves in your situation. When Jesus saw the pain of Mary and Martha and all those there, he felt that. He cried out. He groaned because he knew the effect that sin had had on mankind. And then the Bible says that he was troubled. He was troubled. This word troubled is only found three times in Scripture. It's found here. It's found in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. In John's Gospel, chapter 12, we find it. He said this, Now is my soul, 12 and 27, he says, Now is my tr soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father? It says, Save me from this hour, for this cause I came Unto this hour. You see, we think that what Jesus went through because he was the Son of God did not bring pain on him. It was excruciating. He was troubled at what he was going to go through, but he never backed down. I want you to see something, church. There are things that you go through that are going to trouble your life, but I want to encourage you in the Spirit never back down from it. You believe God is going to push you through it. And it troubled Jesus. Even when in, in chapter 11, the Bible says Jesus was troubled. I don't know what he was troubled about. Some say that he was troubled about all the doubt that was around him. Everybody's crying. Everybody's wailing. I mean, think about it. If you walk into a situation that's dire and everybody there is crying loudly, does that not trouble you? And so they're crying out. Everybody's crying, hysterically crying. And Jesus is there. Some people say that Jesus was troubled because he hurt, because his friend had died. But he knew what he was going to do to change it. And let me tell you today, church, you may be troubled about situations, but never be so troubled that you don't believe that change is coming. Because at the end of this story, we find what change was, was coming. If you go down... The verse 39, Jesus is there with the, everybody gathered around, and he tells everybody to take the stone away. There's a little purpose in this that I want to share with you. Jesus could have rolled the stone away, but sometimes even in your circumstances, there's things and responsibilities that you can have in those times. Don't sit back always and go, well, Jesus, I'm going to sit back and wait for you to do it. Sometimes Jesus is saying, hey, you need, to you need to get off the mat and start walking again. Amen? 
You ever thought about that? A lot of times when we in disappointing situations, we want to lay on the mat. Like John chapter 3, when Peter and John came by and the man was laid at the gate called Beautiful. And what did he said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the man got up and started walking. Let me tell somebody here today, you may be going through disappointment, but sometimes God wants you to do what you can do. And that is get off the mat and start walking. Don't walk back to your past, walk to your future and let God help you come out of your disappointment. And then the last thing that we find, he got to the stone. He got to the tomb in verse 43. He says, and when he thus spoke and he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. All of this time, Mary, Martha, everybody was in disappointment. And now we got to where we all want to be. God, what was dead and we had no hope for, we were hurting. Now God has brought resurrection power and a manifestation of his glory, a manifestation of his purpose they would have never got to had they allowed to stay in their disappointment. I want to tell you something today, church. There's a level of manifestation and glory that if you choose to live in your disappointment, you may never see in your future. What I'm telling you today is don't allow your life to stay in disappointment. Don't allow the enemy to make you believe that those people hurt you and you got to live in that hurt. Don't believe somebody did you so wrong that you can't overcome it because I'm telling you, God wants to call you out of that. He don't want you to stay in your disappointment because you will miss miracles that he wants to do in your life. Would you stand to your feet today? Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you were here for the first time, we just want to get to know you a little bit more and give you some information about our church and how to get connected. All you have to do is click the link above in the description, fill out the information, and we will reach out to you soon. Once again, we are so glad that you joined us online today. And as always, we love you, we're praying for you, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.